South America, part two, globalization and development. Here you can see some income disappear, disparity, the gap in income between rich and poor. Now, if you recall reading in your textbook, uh, this region is, is quite poor in terms of income disappa disparity, in the sense that there is widespread disparity between the rich and the poor within this region. Some of the worst in the world, as you can see, uh, reflected within this, uh, this image here, uh, within this index, uh, measuring this ratio. And you can see uh, Middle and South America are not doing quite well, according to this index, for income uh, disparity within the region. And that's important to know uh, what income inequality and income disparity can do for a region uh, in terms of what it does in terms of economics and its influence on the political sphere and as well. Now, there's many phases of economic development that hit the region uh, that, that the book refers to and walks us through to a lot of different words, but uh, to simplify it, uh, the first stage would be mercantilism, uh, which you can see there illustrated by a mother country and different colonies. So now what this would be would be a policy uh, which a European country, the, the, the colonizer, if you will, uh, would establish a colony, for instance, uh, we would say, uh, let's use the example of uh, France, okay? France is the mother country in this, in this situation. And then we have French Guiana and Haiti as their colonies. And what you could see is that the exchange of goods would not be able to flow freely between Haiti and French Guiana. Uh, meanwhile, those things would flow between mother country of France and, be, and, and those designated colonies. So things would be flowing between uh, France and Haiti and between French Guiana and France, but they would not be, be flowing uh, between them even though they're uh, closely connected on that side of the world and things, uh, but that's to make sure uh, that mother country is well taken care of uh, and that that area remains uh, politically powerful and um, powerfully economic. And that's not something singling out just the French, that's something uh, that was done through colonization uh, throughout the entire world, throughout the entire course of history. Now, in the sense of uh, from that extractive phase, that early economic phase, when we think of extractive, where we're harvesting raw materials from the earth, where it um, would be the idea of an agrarian society and agriculture. And these areas were established for the very purpose of agriculture in a lot of situations, where we have uh, a form of hacienda here in, in Mexico. And hacienda would be, in this case, uh, would be a large scale farming practice uh, that would usually have a residence on hand. And so usually there would be uh, somebody living there, or running the operation perhaps, and then you would have a large scale farming, which differs from that of a plantation, which is our next point, uh, would be a plantation, which is again, large scale um, agricultural production uh, that was established in these areas uh, for things like sugar, sugar, cane, sugar cane plantations like in Haiti uh, from the French and among other places. But if we want to think of early economic phases, we'll think of agriculture, agrarian society, where we're taking the raw materials from the earth and, and producing them for, for economics and in the sense that these areas remained really poor. Uh, however, these countries, uh, like the mother countries, the colonizers, uh, were making money from that area as well as their practices that were happening around the world. So their, their economies were well beyond the agricultural phase or the primary sector, and these were uh, just supplemental incomes where for these countries they weren't even making the money uh, off of the agriculture, and we know that even an agricultural society alone is not a very successful one in terms of global competition uh, for resources. Uh, next, we move into import substitution industrialization. And here's a picture from Brazil post-World War II, uh, but what this would be uh, would be local production of machinery and different products that would usually need to be imported. So these would be places that, like an agricultural society that's um, farming for sugarcane and other uh, soybeans and things like that. They wouldn't be able to uh, make their own planes. They would have to import them from another country because uh, their economy and their infrastructure wasn't built for that. And however, you saw that shift, especially after World War II, for these economies, uh, for these countries to be able to uh, take that on and invest and to be able to have these ideas of large-scale manufacturing in the sense of uh, large machinery and different products like, uh, like planes and, and, and others. And it would, uh, was intended to, to save a great expense from importation from other parts of the world. However, it should be said, whoop, whoop, go back to this, um, not to be too confusing, but it should be said about this that some countries, while many countries pursued it, some countries couldn't handle it 
because there wasn't a large enough market in those countries to sustain those types of endeavors. Uh, and so what you saw then was um, sort of a one step forward, two steps back uh, for, for, for some countries' economies, which led to the next phase uh, of economic development in the sense would be uh, structural adjustment programs. And if we remember SAPs from when we talked about our first chapter, and we didn't really talk about it too much in North America because the United States and Canada did not uh, use those, uh, those funds. But if we remember the World Bank and the IMF or these international lenders, international monetary, fund, uh, international monetary fund, these international financial sectors that would um, lend money out to different countries for different economic development and economic activity to spur growth. However, we remember that structural adjustment programs come at a catch. If you remember our friend was dangling a dollar because you have to be quicker than that. You have to have, there's a, a catch involved. You have to go through the belt tightening measures. And if you remember the belt tightening measures usually came at a cost to some of the social programs that existed within a country. And largely speaking, structural adjustment programs have been rendered unsuccessful in a lot of cases. And so what you saw here were IMF protests in Mexico in the 1980s after the economy was waning because of a global recession that had taken place in the 1970s. There were oil shortages in 73 and 79 around the world, which had a tailspin in both the United States and elsewhere around the world that led to a global economic recession. And uh, lenders were uh, caught off guard by this in the sense that uh, they were not able to keep up with their incurring and surmounting debts. And so IMF and World Bank gets involved in some of these places. And it's really not um, ideal for the people, again, the general people of these countries. We're seeing this actually right now in terms of the privatization of a certain sector. And right now you can see Puerto Rico moves to privatize Trebled Power Company. If you remember, major storms come through, major hurricanes come through the Caribbean this past season devastate the islands, uh, the island countries throughout the Caribbean, especially Puerto Rico, which is a special concern to the United States because it is a territory of ours and the, the people are American citizens of Puerto Rico. And so uh, we know that they're, they're still very slow to get back in terms of um, getting the, their power restored and of course access to water and the like. But in terms of power restoration, uh, this area has been plagued by um, ideas of corruption and, and, and prohibitive costs. And so uh, it's been in debt for, for, for long before the storm even. And so the governor of Puerto Rico is moving to privatize the um, a power company. And usually in the cases of privatization and it, in other practices, it leads to the idea of more corruption because of a lack of transparency. We'll have to see uh, what actually transpires here. It's happening in real time. This headline was a day or two ago from the posting of this video. And so we'll have to uh, keep an eye on this. Um, again, la this lack of confidence of the po uh, uh, power company here in its current form. And so alternative measures will, will take place. Uh, so after these phases of economic development, here comes international trade and investment. And increasing trade between the United States has been very helpful uh, for the Central and South American uh, region. Also, China, who decides to expand its global footprint a bit, mainly for acquiring resources, uh, has reached out to some of these countries as well for economic support and collaboration. And so the importance of China and the United States in this region is very important for the, the local economies there. And the remittances are something that's not within international trade or investment, uh, but a term that was in the book that I think is important as it's it's money earned elsewhere and sent home, not necessarily from one country to another, but from one area to another, usually as a form of gift or support. And remittances take place from maquilladoras, which are in Mexico, these manufacturing plants that exist in different places where, where those um, different members of the family will go work on the plants and send money home. Or you have folks that may be coming from Mexico, working in the United States and sending back money in the form of a remittance. And, and these uh, these amounts of money that are transferred in this way uh, uh, rival that of our enti you know, entire um, financial aid or global aid uh, to a region or to a particular country. So remittances are very important as an informal sector and uh, moving in terms of continuing with that informal idea. The informal economy are usually things like street vending um, and it allows for greater freedom, of course, um, but of course, no job security when you're doing something that isn't uh, quite established. 
uh, there's no taxes involved, and so it's not something that's usually promoted, however, something that one turns to as a, as a secondary or tertiary resort. So the internet and food production, as we sort of continue this lineage of economics to, uh, and development through the region, uh, moves us into the world of internet and modern food production. You can see since 2000, there's been a 2,000% increase in internet use in Middle and South America. Um, this is something where we were starting with only like something like 3% at that point in 2000. We've far exceeded that uh, expectations with the rapid uh, connectedness of the internet throughout Middle and South America. Of course, largely in urban areas, uh, major cities, but even trickling out into rural areas at this point. There's been an increase in large-scale farming. Uh, we moved from subsistence farming at this point, small-scale family farms, to what we would see in the United States Midwest, and southeastern Canada, and these large-scale factory farming uh, that makes money. Now, this isn't something that's entirely new. Um, uh, companies from the United States operated down in these areas for fruit production, and uh, we would see here Dole Food Company, formerly Standard Fruit, and other fruit companies have been operating in, in Hawaii and in Central uh, South America for a long time. Uh, bring up this, this is bananas, all caps, exclamation point, asterisk, and so this is, a, this is a documentary film from a Swedish filmmaker. I encourage you to watch the film, but if not, watch the trailer here. And it becomes uh, somewhat of a novel case uh, with Telez versus Dole Food Company, uh, where the first time Nicaraguans tried Dole Food Company in the United States uh, for the use of DBCP. It's a, a chemical uh, that's used on bananas, uh, banana trees, uh, during the production process of bananas in Chinandega, Nicaragua. First time that they're being tried in the United States um, from Nicaraguans. And um, this, is, this is something that we'll see continue to, I don't know, perhaps develop. Uh, there, something again in 1983 was tried in Florida um, from the sense of um, trying American companies that were active with pesticides inside and outside the United States. Um, but what was, argue, what was being argued here uh, were men that were working on the banana farms in Chinandega, Nicaragua, uh, were not told of the dangers of the chemicals that were being used on the banana trees. It was getting on their clothes, they're inhaling it, of course, and it led to different forms of cancer and sterility. Uh, males not being able to have children or reproduce. And so this has had an effect in Nicaragua and other countries, they've con continually moved uh, from one country and as the economies have increased, they moved to ne then next a poor country. So these are things that have happened uh, previously in countries like Ecuador and Costa Rica. They've now moved into places like Nicaragua, which are slightly less well off than their counterparts that I had just named. And so this is quite profound whether the food companies, in fact, uh, knew of the consequences and didn't share it. Uh, and so eventually this case was uh, thrown out due to fraud in court. Uh, you could follow the entire story there. Again, a great story, very interesting, fun story in the sense that it's entertaining, uh, but quite sad and devastating uh, for the families and for those involved in, in Nicaragua. But again, shows what modern food production is doing uh, to the local environment and to the humans that work, both work and, and eat the food. So now we move into power and politics. And then we first talk about populist political movements in the region of Middle and South America. And if you can remember that large um, income inequality that we showed earlier in, in this segment, uh, showed that there is vast income inequality and income disparity in this region. Now that leads uh, for a populist movement. That would be politics and a, a political message driven by the, the masses, driven by the, the populace, uh, which would be the, the majority of the people. And in this case, uh, majority poor. And so this would be a pushback against elites and powerful people. This is something that this uh, narrative of populist politics had emerged in the previous uh, 2016 presidential election in the United States, where a populist message from that of Senator Bernie Sanders and, and candidate Donald Trump uh, tapped into some of these populist uh, messages. The book gives an example of Hugo Chavez and, and populist movement in, in Middle and South America. So he was elected president in 1998. He directed revenue from the oil industry, he nationalized uh, oil industry in Venezuela, where he was elected president, in support of social programs. Um, and so that was quite important for the masses. At that point in time, he lost his support from 
political elites and economic elites and had to rely on uh, being a champion of the poor, which he crowned himself as. Um, he's attempted to be removed in a coup d'etat, which is uh, uh, pushed back from either a, a military or civilian uh, attempt of a takeover of a government. In 2002, the U.S. was said to have operated covertly in that in the uh, Bush administration uh, because being that he was a, um, a socialist or a very left-leaning politician, uh, many of these in, in and around uh, the world are not well respected in terms of the United States because of our free market capitalist ideas for our American economy and for our vision of the world. And especially in, when we think of uh, Middle and South America because of the United States' long history with Cuba, uh, this is particularly um, particularly um, dangerous in the eyes of certain Americans. Uh, for, for others, uh, maybe not so much. And eventually, uh, Chavez died of cancer while in office in 2013, uh, but not before he handpicked a, a successor, Nicolas Maduro, who is uh, still the current president of, um, of Venezuela. And they've gone through hard economic times. Maduro has raised a minimum wage last year three times in the country to try to stabilize um, the economic situation uh, there. But you can again research this further in the book. Uh, but um, this idea, this, this um, situation in Venezuela continues to unfold uh, from 2013 and onward due to its uh, shifts in economics um, and now facing a bit of a harder time. The drug trade conflict and legalization uh, one may associate parts of Central and South America or Middle and South America with drugs um, would be somewhat of a, of a dated concept, however, yet still very much relevant. Uh, the war on drugs, which began in 1971, is a fail. We just label it as that. It is a failure in that sense that uh, drug production in this area is higher now than what it was uh, back at the time of the declaration of the war on drugs. And so we can um, argue that that uh, war has not uh, been successful. Uh, drug production uh, levels in the region higher now than the start of the war on the war on drugs, and this is in areas particularly of focus in Northwest uh, South America, and in areas of Northern uh, Mexico are some of these targeted areas in the war on drugs and targeted areas of, of mass um, drug production. And uh, so what you've seen to counteract that, it's a sort of a pushback or an additional framework from the war on drugs, would be the decriminalization of drugs in certain countries. And that would be uh, to take the crime or take the punishment aspect away from, from drug use. Some countries are looking at more from a public health standpoint rather than from a criminal standpoint. And certain countries um, like uh, Mexico, uh, Costa Rica, uh, Argentina and Brazil, Ecuador, have decriminalized uh, marijuana, small, um, small amounts of, of things like marijuana, LSD, heroin and cocaine even. And so uh, in order to sort of take the luster away from criminal activity, uh, other countries have followed suit by legalizing medical marijuana, legalizing marijuana, uh, like countries like Uruguay and Chile and Peru, uh, going on this endeavor for the same thing, to try to take the criminal activity away, but also, um, uh, spurring somewhat some small local level economic development in these cases because of the small quantities uh, that were taking place um, before. Pablo Escobar uh, inspired the show Narcos on Netflix. For perhaps uh, check that out. Uh, but Pablo Escobar is very elusive. He's uh, has uh, he had escaped prison multiple times. Uh, finally caught and um, sent to the United States, where he remains in in custody. Uh, but one of the wealthiest men in the world in his prime, he was known as the King of Cocaine, he's responsible for something along the lines of 500 tons of cocaine to be brought into the United States uh, during his time. His net worth in his prime before being captured and before being on the run was something to the tune of, in, in today's dollars, $56 billion, making him one of the richest men in the world at the time. So he doesn't exactly have the inspiring message to uh, not get into that type of industry because he became a very wealthy man, but he uh, became later became an imprisoned man, uh, led a life on the run, and um, however, had the, quite the reputation and actually stained the reputation of countries uh, like his home country of Colombia, which labeled it as a drug country 
and really hurt the tourism industry and even its ability to uh, negotiate and invite uh, different economic uh, productivity and economic development for the sense that it was labeled a dangerous and illicit country and it's taken decades for the country of Colombia to sort of um, work out of that hole uh, of, of those negative labels. Now, United States foreign involvement in this region is quite lengthy. So, unfortunately, when I, uh, so I'll preface it with, in 1823, the Monroe Doctrine uh, was introduced by the United States prohibiting Europeans to no longer get involved in, in colonizing the region. However, that was a, um, a uh, I guess the idea, I was going to try to think of some sort of uh, phrase, but I don't want to think that that would be uh, less confusing, uh, but it would just be the sense that the United States took this as an idea that they could continue to be involved in the region as they saw fit, however Europeans uh, could not. And that definitely was what followed suit. The United States became greatly involved in many different countries throughout history in this region multiple times sometimes, and so for the sake of time and simplicity, I'll touch only briefly on a few of these uh, invasions and occupations. Um, however, can't go deeply into them. I encourage you to continue to pursue them, research them, use the book and, and the internet to really read up on these. Uh, but uh, again, this is about the second wave of interventions in some of these countries. Some of these countries like the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua uh, were, were the ideas of the banana wars, where in, much earlier in time, these countries were invaded for different, practi for, uh, different purposes by the United States. And so this is not just exclusively the only time some of these countries were uh, invaded or intervened from by the United States. In Cuba, 1961, perhaps one of the most notable interventions would be the Bay of Pigs invasion by the Kennedy administration. Uh, Bay of Pigs is in the south southern portion of the island uh, where the United States uh, was uh, pushing back on the newly um, revolutionized country of Cuba, where Cuba had been pushed back from Spanish control, and eventually in 59, uh, the revolution led by uh, Che Guevara and uh, Fidel Castro and uh, very leftist uh, leaning people took place in 1959. The United States decides to get involved in 1961 at the sort of the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Cold War and Cuba's friendliness or coziness uh, with the Soviet Union. The United States uh, tries to get involved, obviously has a very failed attempt um, of this coup and therefore uh, was rel rendered relatively embarrassed uh, from this interaction. In the Dominican Republic in 1965, it was a bit of a deja vu. The United States did not want to see another Cuba in the region and therefore tried to intervene there. Second attempt of uh, intervening throughout uh, the Dominican Republic, again, decades earlier, the United States gets involved there, but again in 1965. In 1973, the United States intervenes in Chile, and this one is notable in the sense where the United States um, sees uh, a threat, again, not maybe an immediate threat to the United States' security, uh, but just the idea that they don't like this uh, simply these boil down to they don't like the guy that's in charge and they don't like the perhaps the mission or the agenda that they may pursue. The United States does not like the Allende regime and so they replace him with um, Pinochet. And Pinochet in, in, in turn leads to decades of killings of his people and uh, many being locked up uh, and, and so it was a disastrous regime, regime change uh, in the coup, uh, Ande takes his own life, and um, uh, rather than face em embarrassment of the, of the coup, and like I said, Pinochet was uh, a terrible leader and a terrible mark in Chilean history, and so there's a great example of a terrible U.S. intervention in Chile and uh, takes us to uh, Nicaragua. It's, you may have heard of it the Iran-Contra scandal, uh, where you've heard of actors like Oliver North, uh, seen on the cover of Time Magazine. I was authorized to do everything that I did. And what was happening here was the Sandinistas in Nicaragua uh, 
were leftist and um, again pro anything leftist at this time was perceived to be a threat to the American uh, system because of this idea of the Cold War. So when we saw leftists in Cuba, uh, leftists in the Dominican Republic and in Chile and Allende, uh, these were threats to the United States and to around the world and so the United States could certainly not uh, see that coming to fruition. So uh, the Iran-Contra scandal would be that there was uh, the Boland Amendment, and not to get into too many details, but there was an, a, Bol a Boland Amendment uh, through the United States Congress that would prohibit the United States to get involved in supporting uh, the Contras. Now the Contras were a right-wing group that was pushing back on the Sandinistas. And so what we saw, uh, and again, there's many takes on this story, what exactly happened, what was illegal, what was not, uh, but what we saw was uh, through arms deals with the Iranians uh, and exchanges going on uh, there through hostages uh, was eventually what boiled down to um, the aiding of the Contras in Nicaragua uh, through some sort of convoluted and murky process because it was prohibited because of the Boland, uh, um, the Boland Amendment. And so what you saw was the United States intervening illegally in Nicaragua uh, through the Contras and his administ the Reagan administration was investigated um, despite Ronald Reagan taking to television a few times, um, did take ownership for some of the activity. However, an investigation found that uh, in fact um, he wasn't aware of the full extent of, uh, full of what was occurring there. Uh, and so a different uh, other people in his administration, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, however you look at it, had to take that sort of fall and, and were held somewhat responsible for that activity. Uh, follows uh, with uh, Grenada in 1983, where there was a coup there. Um, Maurice Bishop was a uh, leader there. He was executed um, in a coup d'etat, and his partner was executed, members of his cabinet were executed, and the United States decides that it um, must intervene uh, for the sake of protecting, um, they cited protecting U.S. medical students there, which some 600 at the time, uh, that they didn't want the country to fall into complete shambles. They wanted to promote democracy. Uh, the U.N. in an overwhelming uh, vote uh, condemned the action as a violation of international law to become so involved by invading Grenada. Uh, however, they did reestablish democratic elections, um, but our ally at the time, Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister, of the United Kingdom and an ally of President Ronald Reagan, who served at the time in the United States, um, publicly supported it, but was said to privately have not liked the notice and have not liked um, the bold uh, sentiment from the United States in this capacity. Now that leaves us to uh, 19, not so fast, it leaves us to uh, Panama in 1989, and this one was perhaps, um, again, maybe equally uh, complicated. We're now in the, um, the, the sort of the exchange from the Reagan to his successor, uh, George H.W. Bush, who was uh, president. And uh, what happened at uh, this time was Manuel Noriega, who was previously a friend as he was uh, somebody that supplied information to the, the DEA and the CIA, which at one point uh, George H.W. Bush was in, in charge of, uh, there was a relationship between Panama and the United States that was considered friendly. Um, however, eventually, uh, Noriega was exposed during the Iran-Contra scandal for his work there. Uh, Bush asks um, Noriega to step down. Um, there are protests for, um, for and against, of course. Um, however, he does not. He remains in charge of Panama, and there, there becomes somewhat of a, of a minor shift. Panama becomes uh, and invites um, monies and investments from actors like uh, Libya and the Soviet Union, again, left-leaning uh, actors around the world, which the United States took as a sign of aggression. Relationship continued to unravel, which was at one point a friendly relationship, continued to unravel between Bush and Noriega, and which ultimately led to uh, what I believe and what many believe uh, started this conflict uh, would be a skirmish between um, U.S. military officers leaving the base to go have dinner and Panamanian military officers 
and there was a skirmish. Eventually, gunfire broke out. These were supposed to be uh, unarmed military men from the United States. Gunfire broke out. One of our U.S. service members was killed. And the next day, the President Bush ordered, in fact, the intervention in Panama, uh, where eventually Manuel Noriega would lose power. And uh, a fact about Manuel Noriega is he passed away over the, uh, the summer, but years, years removed from power, but uh, a major a figurehead uh, no longer existing. And in this uh, stylish tracksuit would be uh, Fidel Castro, who led Cuba from 1976 until 2008. Um, he passed away in 2016. Uh, his brother Raul Castro uh, now leading Cuba uh, for the time being. But we'll talk more about these specific countries when it comes to the subregion. Now urbanization. So there's two terms here, relatively simple terms. The primate city is a city and its suburbs, so a, a metro area that is vastly larger than all others uh, in the country, and it becomes the primary central center uh, for economic or political activity. These examples would be Mexico City in Mexico, Santiago, Chile, Lima, Peru, uh, Buenos Aires and Man uh, in Argentina, and Managua and Nicaragua. These are areas that uh, many of the uh, populations uh, flock to. These are areas that at some times are something like 40% of the entire population residing in and around this city. Uh, and so it's an area that dominates the population a center for the country, uh, which does inspire then political and economic activity. Then we have the brain drain. Now this is a migration of educated or ambitious people uh, to cities or foreign countries that they had left. And it, what it means is um, it harms the community that invested in them uh, for so long in the sense that they can't uh, reap the benefits of those talents. And so what you maybe often see are uh, small poor communities that uh, raise people and they raise them through this. These people are using the public education system, the healthcare system, they're using the infrastructure. This idea that it takes a village, it cultivates a young people and they go on, they go to school and, and then they leave. And so that area that, that invested in those children or those adults uh, don't reap the benefits because they go elsewhere. And we see this brain drain, people coming to the United States typically. One in four Amer uh, doctors in the United States are, are foreign born. Uh, and so uh, this idea that's uh, happening in the community. I would argue that this idea could be taken uh, to the issue of, of DACA that's currently going on in this country for uh, a deferred action for childhood rivals. We talked about it in the United States state section of things uh, where there's this idea of some from the right in this country to deport um, or at least say that they're not welcome somewhat of 800,000 uh, young people um, and and again if these people were here from a young age the United States has invested in these people in their in in terms of their education in terms of their livelihood and so I think it only makes sense from both an ethical and moral obligation but also an economic um, uh, critique or argument that they would also be welcome in this country as well. So I think this idea of the brain drain would be tr dramatic in the sense that if, um, if, if immigration is not addressed in this country, what would, what would uh, come to fruition from, from that? The urban landscapes, we talked about this a little bit. Perhaps you've watched City of God and you see that the favela, the Brazilian slum, these shanty towns or squatters, um, uh, squatters that occupy the shanty towns exist throughout the entire region. Uh, favelas is the Brazilian term for Brazilian urban urban slum, again characterized in the movie. And you can only imagine that the infrastructure in these areas are lacking, uh, lack of sewage systems, lack of um, access to freely available water, uh, other utilities such as electricity even at times, depending where. Uh, some communities Again, these aren't government sanctioned. I don't think it would be safe to say that governments are thrilled that these are happening. However, you'd see in certain areas that governments are actually supplying um, resources and supplies for shanty towns to improve them. So rather than being made out of tin, some areas are supplying them with other um, materials to improve the structure of these shanty towns uh, or favelas and actually improving them. So they're actually somewhat embraced, uh, embraced them. Uh, during my field work, uh, when I was in San Jose, uh, Costa Rica in 2015 for some for some research pertaining to perceptions of mosquito-borne diseases. I, I uh, one of my field sites was uh, La Carpio in the Aruca province in San Jose, Costa Rica, and there were uh, tens of thousands of migrants from Nicaragua that had 
and began to squat and live in, a, in an area that was similar to this, although less densely populated. And um, very interesting to see that the, um, uh, the lack of natural resources, uh, the lack of resources that they have only living off of the natural land and having to take commutes into the other part of the city for sort of menial jobs. Uh, but I think the importance uh, that hits home to this would be the lack of security, and not both in terms of danger, as you can see in City of God, but just the entire, even the mental security uh, that you're living on land that you've claimed, and it's a very fluid lifestyle, and there's a lot of um, pressure even on mental health, um, that the folks that are living in these types of situations uh, could in fact um, lose everything that they've worked towards for their, for their home uh, through the cases of urban redevelopment and things like that, through the mega events that uh, Rio de Janeiro has been hosting, and on other sort of pursuits by uh, development in these regions. Now, urban transportation um, is sort of gets a bad mark in terms of this region. We know that um, this region isn't particularly um, great in terms of its urban infrastructure and urban transportation. You have areas that have uh, quite traffic problems and other areas of pollution problems as a, resu uh, as a result. Uh, however, there are some areas that had uh, great planning skills in terms of um, its urban infrastructure. And the example here is uh, Curitiba in Brazil. In 1968, it had a master plan and it planned its entire growth centered around uh, public transportation that makes thousands of runs each day uh, moving uh, millions of people. So uh, it's a sort of um, a template for urban, uh, smart urban, grow smart urban planning uh, for the region. Now population and gender would focus on lower birth rates that's happening right now in the region. Um, so populations, as they've continued to urbanize, as women have continued to gain access to education and employment, uh, childbearing has waned. These are not having the larger families that they once had. And so the rate of natural increase has dropped from nearly two to just over one from 1975 to 2014, really again slowing the general uh, population of the region. However, it should be said that 28% of the region's population is under the age of 15 years old. And that being said, uh, just because such a large percentage of the population is 15 years or, or, or younger, um, right now the entire region has 630 million people. And even continuing at that rate of natural increase, uh, that would continue to 780 million people by 2050. So the area will continue to grow just slightly slower than, than what it was on track to do in the first place. Uh, you can see human well-being as measured here in both in terms of economic and its development index. You can see that uh, much of this region situates itself in the, in the same uh, category for human development. Uh, Large exceptions would be some countries that are situated, uh, that are landlocked countries of Paraguay and Bolivia, and then some countries within um, Middle America, in, in Central America. And you could see here again, a uh, very similar economic situation from uh, gross national income per capita uh, in this region as well. The socio-cultural issues uh, would be the cultural diversity and race in the area. And that's something that I mentioned before in the sense that uh, the diverse groups of people have joined the continent and have joined the indigenous populations since the 1500s, and that's created the Matiso, uh, which is a mixed culture. It's uh, usually um, a, a majority in a lot of places here in the region. There's some two terms to sort of understand um, uh, regarding culture, uh, but also race, again, being, uh, being an issue here in, in the United States, uh, I, would, I mean, in the in this area, not would say an issue like it is in the United States, um, but in the sense that uh, race is just being a factor, uh, would take us to the statistic that um, in Brazil, black workers earn only 60% of what the average white worker earns. So that is um, unfortunately just simply not good enough, and um, that'd be problematic for minority groups in the region of Middle and South America uh, with that uh, terribly daunting statistic. But what I would urge you is to stop and think about that because in the United States, the average black worker owns, earns only 65% of the average white worker. 
And so that should be a little bit of a, hmm, I'm gonna stop and think about that for a second. Or perhaps you're jotting notes and you sort of pick your head up because that is sort of an alarming statistic. We wanna point fingers in this book by using that only 60% of that of Brazil, uh, when in the United States, in fact, we are doing uh, literally no better. And so uh, that just shows that the connections between race in Middle and South America are not that much improved in, from the economic sense of what they are in North America, that people of different races have a higher vulnerability in economics. Uh, however, culture has uh, culture and race has produced a, a melting pot for the region, which brings us to a carnival, which is a big party. And everybody likes parties, so to talk one slide about parties of this year, if you're freely available, go down to Brazil, check it out, February 9th to the 14th. Um, if you're actually going to Carnival, we'll uh, give you a special permission to miss uh, your online lectures. But um, what it is, it's a, just a celebration of just er anything that sounds fun. Processions, parades, parties, dancing, food, music, you name it. And what that is, it's an anticipation of Lent. Now, Lent is a period of 40 days uh, preceding Easter that many Christians uh, around the world um, uh, participate in and what it is it's a fast or avoidance of uh, global or uh, worldly indulgences and so it's essentially a Mardi Gras party or a Shrove Tuesday party that leads up um, until Ash Wednesday where you have the 40 days before Easter which is more of a solemn time and self-reflection time in this culture uh, but leading up to that is a massive party that receives global attention and its origins are into the 1600s and before it really ramped up in the 1819s and even present day. The family and gender roles in this country are quite traditional in the sense that they're inspired from both religion and former um, status quo, if you will. Uh, but the extended family is more important in this region than it would be considered elsewhere, perhaps even in the United States, uh, where this family here cons um, consists of related individuals beyond the nuclear family. Now, of course, a family that consists of related individuals beyond the nuclear family is an extended family. That's every family. But that idea of the closeness to aunts and uncles and cousins uh, that are really your friends and your business partners and perhaps even living with you or near you uh, is far more common here in Middle and South America than it would be in the United States. Uh, so a nuclear family just being uh, your parents and siblings so it pushes well beyond the nuclear family in terms of popularity in this region. And so there's two ideas, these two terms uh, that come um, from the region that are sort of regionally distinct in the sense of the Marianismo is a set of values uh, based on the Virgin Mary in the, in, in, from, a, from a religious perspective, the mother of Jesus uh, that defines proper social roles for women. These types of things would be uh, chastity, motherhood, and service to the family. So we would imagine very traditional roles uh, for a female explained here through, through this region, which is again tied to the, to the religion of the region. And then we have the machismo, which is a set of values that defines a manliness in, in, in the region. Uh, this is, would be honor, respect, uh, fatherhood. And if you think about it, fatherhood uh, is, is part of the machismo. And, and that's so important because if you remember, if you remember even from what I just said, a few moments ago, uh, the folks that worked in the banana production in Chinandega, Nicaragua, as, among other places, uh, were rendered sterile after coming in contact with the pesticides used. And you can see that not only would one um, be devastated at that news, uh, that they would no longer be able to bear children, it actually has a set, uh, it actually is an attack on their set of values, is what they, what they, um, what they and what others perceive of manliness in this culture and the ability to not have children. So it actually plays a profound impact on their, on their gender roles in the region. So it actually is uh, kind of interrelated, which is why I included them. Uh, now sort of machismo is a little bit being more tied to being a money maker from sort of an economic standpoint, but uh, historically these were the cases uh, for the family and gender roles. Now, religion and contemporary life in this region, of course, all beliefs in the region are trickled through from, uh, from indigenous religions to things like voodoo uh, to uh, other religions that have snuck forward, different forms of Christianity, but widely speaking, uh, Roman Catholicism, number one religion in, in this region in terms of uh, practices and followers. Um, 
and this within Roman Catholicism there's this term liberation theology that was interjected in the book this is a movement in the Catholic Church kind of beginning in the 1970s uh, that encourages the uses of the teachings of Jesus um, to mobilize the poor and improve uh, their life and to organize uh, and it actually encourages the rich to promote social uh, and economic e uh, equity and so you can imagine this liberation theology sort of pairs well with populist movements in the in the area and that and that idea of liberation theology has largely waned now in the country it's not something that's really being actively uh, pursued uh, by the catholic church uh, but that does segue uh, greatly into america's first pope pope francis becomes the leader of the catholic church in 2013 he is a man, uh, Father Jorge Bergoglio of Argentina. And what it does is it signals a change in location of the world's majority of Catholics. And so in 1910, 65% of, of Europe was Catholic, only 24% of this region of Middle and South America. Now in 2010, 39%, almost 40% of the world's Catholics come from this region and only 24%, less than a quarter now from Europe. And so you're seeing a shift uh, in terms of the focus of the Catholic Church um, uh, being here, America's first Pope and Pope Francis. And that actually wraps us up in terms of the human dimensions of uh, Middle and South America. So again, continue to read the book, uh, focus on um, the concepts that we had covered here in the, um, in the slides, and we'll set you up for the subregions in the following video, and you'll be ready to take uh, that next exam.